Welcome back to another session. I, I hope you are well. In today's session, I'd like to talk about how to, how to use your imagination. Um, I will be begin uh, with the basics. Now, let me take a step back um, and address what was the conclusion of the session I covered previously, in which I made reference to how, in order to use your imagination, you have to use it effectively. But you, you always, like most things, you start where you are, you make mistakes, and eventually you get to a place of effectiveness. Uh, efficiency being um, doing the right thing and effectiveness referring to doing things right. Many of us are not, or we're not trained with regards to how the mind works. Even fewer were taught how to use the imagination. So as I start today's session and the sessions that follow, what you will hear will be practical steps. We're now moving away from the realm of just ideas and, and philosophies and principles and theories. And I'm going to be going into the practical ways in which you can change your life by changing the way you think. But to be more direct with regards to this series, how you can go from being a person who suffers from depression uh, or a person who suffers from anxiety, worry or doubt, uncertainty, uh, and therefore unhealthy, and become a person who is living a life of abundance and, and gratitude and fulfillment and love and happiness. Uh, how do you transcend your suffering and find yourself on the other side? Well, let me start as follows. We, we are very, very lucky as human beings uh, to, to, to be gifted with something that, in my opinion, puts us on par with the angels, if you believe in such. And this is simply because we've been given this creative ability. We are co-creators in this life. You see, a dog can only be a dog. Dogs have senses, they have instincts and their genetics, and therefore they can only be what they are programmed and they can only express what they have the ability to do. Humans have higher powers, intellectual faculties that enable us achieve more, be more, do more, create whatever environment we want. Some animals have some intellectual faculties, but they lack all of the broad ranges of faculties. For example, we know that a dog has emotions, but a dog cannot interpret the emotions that they have. They don't also have the, the whole broad breadth of emotions. Dogs do not have feelings, just as animals do not have feelings. They do reason, and before perhaps you start getting old with me, recognize what the word feelings represent. We are purely energy. Um, at the very fundamental level, we are energy. And energy resonates and vibrates based on a frequency. And whatever frequency we find ourselves um, could be a lower frequency or a higher frequency. And so as human beings, just imagine if I communicated with you based on the frequency that I find myself or the vibration that I find myself or the, the, the wave level that I find myself, it's more complicated. So human beings, we've come up with a word to describe the, the state of our vibration, the state of our energy, the level of that energy or the resonance that we may be in relative to other energies around us. We call that word feelings. So feelings is something that we use to describe how our body reacts or perceives that it is reacting to um, a resonance level. We call that feelings. In any case, um, animals and dogs and, and mammals have some intellectual faculties. They do not have what we have. They do not have perception or perspective. They do not have an imagination. They do have memories. So they have a memory, uh, like humans, perhaps not to the same extent, and sometimes even better, because theirs is very instinctual. Whereas ours is, is, not, is less instinctual and requires more 
uh, you may see brawn and willpower. Um, animals and mammals do not have willpower and, um, and more. So human beings are very special. One of those intellectual faculties is the imagination. And the question is, how do you use this imagination? If you're suffering from depression or you're suffering from anxiety, you're suffering from any condition, whether it be ME or whether it be chronic fatigue, I put forward a position that it has less to do with the condition and it has more to do with the image you have of yourself in your subconscious mind. And to attempt to change what is without before changing what is within is the struggle of life. Uh, I, the reference is the snapback effect. Um, I don't have a rubber band here, but let's just assume that I did. Um, and if you had a rubber band, and you were to pull a rubber band and you could hold the rubber band in that position using force and it will stay there as long as you exert an equal or greater force to the tension in the rubber band. The moment you leave the rubber band, it snaps back to its original position. And in the same way, most people live their lives with force. And so for people who are suffering from any mental health issue or physical health issue, there is an aspect where you're trying to learn and overcome uh, and, and move away from that suffering using brute force, using your reasoning faculty. And you're using less of your imagination. And for that reason, you're always snapping back to where you were. So you see people who then come to a position where they say, this is just the way I am. There's nothing I can do. Well, there is something you can do. And that thing is to learn how your imagination can be used and you can change your self-image in your subconscious mind using your imagination and you can reprogram that self-image and once you have changed the image you have of yourself within the external body the external person who you are will have to change so it's consistent with your internal self-image your, your physical body is a slave to your subconscious self-image. The body simply follows whatever the mind tells it or whatever the mind dictates. So if you want to change the outcomes external, you change the picture internally. And that picture is not just a picture in your imagination because you can change the picture in your imagination like watching a movie. But if you haven't changed the production quality, the production, the script, you haven't changed the cinema room or the, the, the theater of the mind, you find actually the results you get uh, are temporary because you snap back to who you used to be. Uh, I use the reference to uh, a regulation device, uh, a thermostat which has a sensor and once you've preset the temperature at 20 degrees, you know, the internal temperature will be 20 degrees. Uh, the heat source or the cooling source will modulate to maintain that temperature in that space. You can open the windows, and if you open the windows, yes, you will have some temporary uh, uh, air exchange, but eventually the heating device or the cooling system will modulate to bring the temperature back to where it should be. And therefore, if you want to have, uh, assuming 20 degrees is, a, is representative of perhaps a, a depressive state, um, but you want to come down to perhaps 10. Very easy. You don't have to learn how engineering works. You don't have to be a plumber. You don't have to be a heating engineer. You don't even have to learn or read the manual. You simply know how or where to touch on that thermostat. And once you know what to turn, you can change the dials. And once you've set the thermostat and the sensor to 10 degrees, the temperature in the space will reduce to that level and will be maintained at that level until you change it again. That's how your self-image works. You have a preset self-image and that could be based on your, your goals, your dreams, your experiences, your environment, your past, things that have happened to you, things that you've done to you or things you did to yourself. That's all in the past. I, don't, I, I genuinely, quite frankly, when I meet people and when I interact with people, I don't want to talk about your past. I really don't. Both 
your successes in the past or your failures in the past. I couldn't care less. I only care about you presently and your future because your potential is the gap between who you are today and what you can be. And I'm always asking the question, I'd like to see that gap. I'd like to see you become who you could be because by doing so, you gift us and the world the best version of yourself. I don't want to hear about what you did in the past and who you were or what, you know, how life was great. With all due respect, that was the past. Someone else has spent that check. I want to know what you can produce, not just materially. I mean, what you can produce in terms of your spirit and your mind and your intellect and therefore allow your body to produce good fruit. To change your life, you have to be willing to make changes to your life. Now, this is not simply semantics and using words in a funny way. If you think about the words carefully, to change your life, you have to be willing to change certain things about your life. And that means to change your life and the outcomes you want in the future, there are subtle changes that have to be made in the present to get you from where you are to where you want to get to. It wouldn't happen by chance and it wouldn't happen by happenstance and it's not destined to happen. If you're suffering from depression or anxiety, you have to change your self-image. Now, the first question therefore becomes, how can you change your self-image? Well, there are two strategies. There are more, but I'll share two with you in, in, in this session and maybe in sessions that follow, if I have time permitting, I might expand on that. The first I, I alluded to in the prior session, which is the fears of your mind. And the second is mental simulation. Let's start with the first. Theatre of your mind, or the cinema of your mind. Firstly, let's just assume that in your house, you had a movie room, or you had a space that could be designated as a movie room. Uh, there were no, let's say there were no windows, so you had darkness in the space. How would you design that room or that space? Well, I would imagine you would want some chairs, um, if you're going to watch movies, you'd certainly want some, a screen. Um, you would want the screen to be a certain size. So depending on the configuration of the room, you might want a very large screen. Uh, you might want um, uh, very comfortable chairs. You might want a footstool. You might even want a certain uh, equipment to make the whole place feel like a movie room. Maybe some lightning equipment. Um, and then you want to have an, an, an assortment of movies to watch that you can, um, you can choose from. Once you've designed a room, now you have to go into the space and you have to use the room. And one of the things you might notice is once you've put everything together, you might realize, well, the sound isn't quite how I want it to feel. I like something more powerful. I like something less powerful. And, and Or you might even find, well, do you know what, I've, I've done all of this, but there's still noise from next door. Uh, the kids are playing in the room next door, and you know, I just, I just like peace. So you might decide, well, I should have insulated the space beforehand, before I actually fitted everything together. Now, the point of all of this is to simply say, it starts with design. You have to, first of all, decide what you want. Then you have to see it in your mind's eye. And then you have to start creating it. And so in terms of changing your self-image, the theater of your mind simply means you have a, think of yourself as being, having designed a cinema space. And it's just you. There's no one else. It's just a chair and a screen. And you sit there on the, on, the, on, the, on the sofa, the chair, whatever makes you comfortable. And on the screen is presented to you, your life. And all you have to do is sit and watch. You're watching you, uh, you see your life being played out. But in this particular instance, you see yourself and you see your life being played out in the best possible light. You see, many people, we, we all have critics. The, the, the biggest critic we have is within. You know, the saying is, is if, if the enemy, um, uh, the enemy is not without, it's always within. Um, and, and the enemy without can do us no harm, except the enemy within gives that permission. And so for many people who suffer from depression and anxiety, or most of life's unpleasant uh, sufferings, 
I hate to use the word self-inflicted, but I have to use the word self-inflicted because uh, the opposite of that is self-healing. Is Most of our suffering is self-inflicted and also most of our suffering can be self-healed. We, we do not have to look to someone without. And so in this cinema you've created and designed, you just see yourself it's on the screen. Imagine a movie of your life and yourself being played out. And the question I start with is, what do you see? What do you see? And for many people, what people tend to see playing on the screen of their mind are all of their past failures, moments of shame, embarrassment. Um, you might say things they've done they're not too proud of, things that were done to them that were you know, horrible. And the more they watch that movie, they relive and they experience negative emotions and feelings that correspond with the images they are seeing. And so what you have is this cycle that never ends. You're replaying things you do not want in your life. And you're feeling in a way that you're not happy with. Your thoughts determine and control your feelings. Your feelings, especially the, 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 the very intense ones, will determine the actions you take. Your actions lead you to develop into a routine, a habit. Um, uh, those habits and routines will create um, a lifestyle, that lifestyle is your life. So you can walk backwards and simply say, what am I seeing on this screen? And therefore, if I want an outcome that is different to what I have, I have to go back to the beginning, which is I have to change the pictures on the screen. I have to change the movie I am playing and I have to see myself in a better light. Performing perfectly well. Think of yourself as a tennis player. Don't see yourself as an average player. In that screen of your mind is the one time you have permission to lie to yourself. Yes, the reality is that you're average, but in that screen, in that cinema, which is your, your, your place of peace, you can see yourself playing just as well as the greats. You can intensify the emotions associated with what you see. You can get so emotionally aroused and involved with what you see on that screen that you almost have certainty Remember, you're using your imagination, but you almost have certainty that you are great. And you do this repeatedly. You do this regularly. You do this daily and weekly, and you persist. And what you find is suddenly you start to create this gulf between your reality and what's going on in your mind. Your reality is based on an existing self-image from the past. You've now created this theatre in your mind and you're starting to generate a new image, a new movie of your life. And suddenly you find that there is, there is this um, separation. We call it a separation of charge. On one side is your past and on one side is the present or the future. And if you continue to replay and play and play this, suddenly you find at some point this will die. You become born again. You die to your old self and you're born anew. Why? because you've created a picture. Now the second way is called mental simulation. In the session prior, I made reference to how um, in the West, most pilots are trained using flight simulators. If you want to learn to ride a bike, you don't use a simulator, you use a bike. If you want to learn how to ride a motorbike, you do not use a simulator, <laughs> you use a motorbike. If you want to learn to drive a car, or a bus, or a train, you use a simulator. Planes are sophisticated machines. And one of the reasons they're very sophisticated is because they have, I mean, incredible engineering uh, incorporated into how they function, including something I alluded to before, which is an autopilot, where you can preset the destination and the pilot doesn't have to fly it. But because they are so sophisticated, the pilots have to be trained for the worst case scenarios. And therefore, the best way, unlike what was done in the past, in modern times, flight simulators is how they train the best of pilots. And the conditions of the flight simulator are just as good as if it were real. Sometimes you're learning and you're using a simulator and it's just as vivid as real life. Your self-image can be re-engineered, changed, 
improved by thinking of your mental simulator as a gift you've been given. And this simply means, unlike a, a movie, the theatre of your mind where you just sit back and watch and see yourself and connect with the emotion, with a flight simulator you are performing, you're doing. With the theatre of your mind you're using simply your sensory faculties as part of your imaginative process. With the theatre of with your mental stimula simulation you're using more than just your sensory faculty sight, you're using everything. This is where we use touch. Now I'll say this so you can understand how incredible um, this concept is. When you use your intellectual faculties, especially your imagination, you will need to rely on, within the imagination, a sensory ability that you have. Sight, smell, touch, taste, and um, hearing. When you use your theatre of your mind, because it's like a movie, you can simply sit back and just see. See your life and you're, you're seeing your, your life play over, over and over. You're playing the life you want to have. So primarily you're using sight. That's level one. Level two is where you take it to the next stage and say, well, not only am I going to see, I'm also going to hear. Hence my reference to the surround system, the sound system. So you can hear words and what people are saying and you can hear two or three people who agree on the new you in the movie. Sound. In mental stimulation, you can, you can use much more than one, two or three or four senses. You can use all of them and you should use all of them. And the way this works is simple. The most powerful of the senses with regards to how the imagination works is touch. I wouldn't have time to go into it in today's session, but if you study all of the books of antiquities, what you find is that the touch, the ability to touch and feel with your touch is the most powerful. Yes, you can see yourself and that's just as good. That's good, but not as good. Yes, you can hear and that is good. You can smell, you can sense, that is good. Touching is the most powerful. So in mental stimulation or simulation rather, what you're trying to do is see yourself doing, actively doing. And that might mean, for example, if you suffer from chronic fatigue, you see yourself playing a, a sport, holding a tennis um, rack, or perhaps playing football, holding a football touch. You have to connect the sense of touch and all the other five senses in your imagination as part of your simulation process. With a simulator, remember, when you're learning how to fly a plane, you have a module, uh, you do the first module and you pass or you fail and you, you see, like playing video games, you get better and you get better and you get better. The same process works. Rather than just watch a movie in the theatre of your mind, in mental simulation, you're simply practising. And that means you're practising to perfection. You're not just practising and doing things. You're saying, no, I want to see constant and never-ending growth and improvement. So I'm going to practice until so you see yourself being healthy and happy and you keep getting better and you keep improving. You're almost designing a system, but you're practicing, which is partly why in a, in a flight simulator, it can be very physical because not only are you pulling things and moving things and turning and twisting, it makes it real. So therefore, all of those movements, by using touch and sound and, 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 and light and sight and hear, what you find is, you're activating all the senses, you're bringing together all of the senses in such a way that they stack upon each other and you're creating, and here is the most important thing, you're creating very strong feelings and emotions. Those feelings, remember vibration, allows you to move from a lower vibration to a higher vibration. You want to go to as high a vibration as you can and that process allows you to start to clean away the old self-image and draw paint, create a new self-image. You have to see yourself performing perfectly. In the theatre of your mind, you just see yourself performing perfectly. In your mental uh, simulator, you have to feel and know that you are performing perfectly. Um, uh, I made reference in the session uh, how um, the, the great writer says, you know, except you think like children, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. In other words, except you see yourself like a child, and this is where children 
are so fascinating that they can sit under the sun, um, sit in the garden on grass, and they're somewhere else. They're playing in the school playground whilst being at home with their best friend, and they're playing football and they're enjoying themselves and uh, that you can see the excitement on their faces. Why? Not only are they using theatre of a lie, they're using mental simulation. They live in it. Um, they live it so strongly that you can see a child um, do this for hours and not get hungry and, 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 and return back to the physical world and be full because they've been living in their imagination and in the future and it's so nourishing to the soul and the spirit that a physical body does not lack, does not want anything. Now I'm going to stop here in today's session and in the session that follows perhaps if there's something else I can add to this, I will, otherwise we'll move on to something else. Um, but I will say this, um, this process does not happen without some effort and you will find that um, um, one of the stumbling blocks is self-confidence and one of the outputs of all of this is also self-confidence. If you have a low concept of self and you don't feel confident, then you will not see why you should try. But if you try and, and you repeat it and you improve, you start to see how your self-confidence builds. What we are trying to get to, especially with those who suffer from depression and anxiety, is to get to a place whereby your confidence has integrity. It doesn't mean you're overtly confident, but it simply means you do not have situational confidence. You're not confident in certain situations. Or it doesn't mean you have fluctuating or inconsistent levels of self-confidence. And for most people, a lot of the anxiety that they face comes from a lack of self-image. You have a poor self-image in your subconscious. You have a poor self-identity. And therefore, you have a, a poor level of self-confidence. And you see yourself as not being worth anything. So your self-worth is not something to write home about. And therefore, you find actually you don't have this sense of self-assurance. They are all connected. It begins with your self-image. I hope today's session has been useful.